Let me read a quote uh, from the externalization of the hierarchy um, where they had the idea of wanting to transform the church at the end of the 21st century and it appears to be right on target and they wanted to make a new uh, universal religion that it would be readily acceptable to everybody and so uh, she says um, there would be the activity of the outpouring of the Christ principle and denominations uh, would be affected and she states the church as a teaching factor would should take the great basic doctrines and shattering the old forms in which they are expressed and held show their true and inner spiritual significance. The prime work of the church is to teach uh, and teach ceasingly, preserving the outer appearance in order to reach the many who are ac accustomed to church usages. Teachers must be trained. Bible knowledge must be spread. The sacraments must be mystically interpreted. Now that's an interesting statement because that's exactly what we see happening today in the emergent church movement where they are taking the Catholic sacraments and they are reinterpreting them. You mean even away from what we would call orthodox Catholic interpretation of what the sacraments are meaning a means to give grace toward salvation. Right. Well and they're going right along with the Catholicism the, the teachings of Catholicism. Many of, of the things that we find in the emergent church movement today that appears to have accepted these very same principles that are right out of the New Age movement because they're reading New Age authors all the time. Uh, they are implementing them inside the church. So you have the sacramentalism that they're talking about, the liturgy, the candles being lit, quiet spaces that they make for themselves, the uh, mantras that they do, the labyrinth walking, the meditation. All these things are Christianized but they're still the same thing. They're pagan in origin, in other words, is what you're saying. Yeah. And they've just yeah. had pagan labels. Talk about labyrinth walking. You mentioned that. I don't think a lot of people really know what that is. Well, I think before you begin to accept the practice, you need to know where its origins come from. And we find that labyrinth walking it predates Christianity. Now, many of these people in the emergent church movement will go back to the medieval churches, uh, they substituted going to Jerusalem at the time. They weren't able to travel there, so they uh, put the labyrinths in the floor, and they would walk the labyrinths in place of going to Jerusalem. But again, this is not a Christian practice. Uh, it has nothing to do with Christianity. In fact, uh, when we look at the people that uh, brought it into uh, the public eye today, uh, we find some disturbing things, what they're teaching it actually is. Uh, for example, uh, Dr. Jean Houston and Grace uh, Episcopal Cathedral, um, she's the one that started to make it more popularized and it was Lauren Autris that uh, brought it to Grace Cathedral and, and, and Christianized the idea to the church. And uh, I think we need to understand where they're coming from and what they actually believe. Um, Dr. Houston is the past president of the Association for Humanistic Psychology, and she's a main promoter of the New Age in America. And she teaches exercises in evolutionary memory. The man may discover ways to alter his consciousness as a gateway to subjective realities. And she believes in contact with spirit entities and altered states of consciousness. In her 1992 book, The Hero and the Goddess, she recommended now taking a, a favorite god or a goddess by the hand, a Greek one, this time explore the labyrinth winding of your left hemisphere. Take the deity by the hand and begin to explore the labyrinth winding of your right hemisphere. So she ties it in with the goddess, which has nothing to do with Christianity. This is, this is a pagan origin, which she is using here. And uh, so we find that Lauren Autris brought it back to Grace Cathedral and Grace Cathedral itself is involved in many New Age type right. of practices. Uh, they even talk about using the Koran, uh, which is a very anti-Christian book because uh, the Muslims believe that God has no son, which is the, the cornerstone of Christianity. Without the Son of God, we have no sacrifice and resurrection. We have no gospel. So uh, she has this organization called uh, Veriditas, and she states the labyrinth is a path of prayer, a walking meditation, a crucible of change, a watering hole for the spirit, and a mirror of your soul. And so people walk the labyrinth and they get these experiences. They walk 
uh, to a certain point. They stop, they pray. A lot of these people will wear uh, headphones and listen to some kind of worship music. The lights are down low, the candles are going, and they feel like they're getting a sacred experience by doing all this. But this is completely divorced from Christian uh, teaching. You will not find the labyrinth in, in the Bible in any shape or form. Uh, Paul didn't tell us to go walk the labyrinth as we pray and help us enhance our spirituality. But this is what these people are doing. They're introducing foreign uh, religious items, incorporating them into Christianity for people to enhance or improve or grow in their spirituality. Why do you suppose people wind up there anyway? Why do they look for that type of thing? Well, I think once you start not looking toward the Word of God and seeing that as your authority and seeing that as a means of, uh, as uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 talks about, it being everything you need to grow, and everything you need in your spiritual life, and you remove yourself from the Word of God, you're open to just about anything. And so that's why I see them accepting all these things, uh, because they're searching still. But as Christians, we're no longer searching. We have found the truth. And we're to be grounded in the truth so that we will continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. And the problem is they have an appetite, they have a hunger, but it's no longer for the truth. It's for other religious practices that are found all over the world. Or more experiences and sensations. Yeah, they can, all these right. things are tied to experiences. And the right. problem is they don't understand that just because you have a religious or spiritual experience doesn't mean it's always from God. And, right. Spirituality and God are divorced in some cases, meaning there is another side to the spiritual world. So Exactly. Right. And so yeah. you have to test your experience by the Word of God. But many of these people don't want to test it or uh, they don't care to because they just like their experience. They like their f the feeling they're getting from it. And so they just continue on the same path. Yeah. One of the other practices that's very common now is yoga. And of course that ties in as well towards uh, transcendental meditation. They're not, they're not the same thing, but they're very closely related. Uh, yoga, uh, could we go along with the concept that yoga is only a physical stretching exercise, something to calm you down, helps you get through your life? Uh, can you divorce it from its religious origins? I don't think you can. I, I know that that's how they're presenting it these days. Uh, but yoga is integrated into Hinduism. You cannot practice Hinduism without yoga. You can practice Christianity without yoga. Mm -hmm. So yoga is an essential part of Hinduism. And basically it's there for you to yoke with another god. And many of these poses, these stretching exercises that people want to believe are, are just physical exercises are really... Um, worshipful poses to other gods in Hinduism. And in Hinduism, there are hundreds of millions of gods. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference between the Hindu philosophy of who God is and what Judaism or Christianity teaches, that there is only one God. And so you practice yoga, you start to get some experiences from it, and one thing leads to another. And of course, with yoga, you practice uh, breathing exercises, you practice mantras or meditation to help improve as you're in those postures. And uh, the whole idea of yoga is to free up this energy that's at the bottom, the, the, the base of your spine, that will go up these energy sources called the chakras that will enlighten you. You're talking so, about kundalini type of yes, exercise. Yes, kund okay. kundalini. So right. the idea is to release the kundalini when you start getting deeper into the yoga practices. And of course, again, you have nothing related to Christianity in all this. Jesus didn't come along and teach yoga, even though yoga was practiced uh, at that very time in India. Uh, he wasn't teaching that. His apostles didn't teach that. He didn't teach any physical exercise to help improve us spiritually. But yet that is what is being presented to those that are involved uh, in the emergent church movement and even... Uh, to the public today.